Hey guys, if you'd like to support what we do on this channel, consider donating to us on Patreon, so we can make fun videos like this. Well, aren't we Miss Self-Sufficient USA? There's a lot of great anime out there. And a lot of great dubs. Why don't I do you a fucking favor and show you what color your brain is? But not all the great anime have great dubs. Nita. A while back we made a video about why some anime get redubbed. So now let's flip the script and talk about some anime that we'd personally like to see redubbed. Obviously we can't predict the future, but it's fun to speculate what could happen, or rather what we'd like to happen. And that's what this video is, less of an objective prediction or in-depth analysis, and more of a wishful thinking list. We mean no personal disrespect to the people who may have worked on these projects or the fans that grew up with these English versions. We'll try to provide reasons for our opinions where we can, asking what about these dubs we think could be improved. Was it the script, the casting, the translation, the directing, all of the above? You're overacting! Be more natural! Less is more! Yes, of course! Again, we're in no way an authority on the matter, and we hope everyone can share their thoughts in the comments down below. Again, not all these suggestions are going to be entirely practical, nor are we saying that these shows will definitively be redubbed at all, as a lot of them probably won't be profitable ventures for these companies. But for the slim chance that anyone in the licensing industry is watching this video, uh, take notes, I guess? Here's a few anime we think deserve a modern redub, in no particular order. Even if you've somehow never heard of Revolutionary Girl Utena, the series is a hallmark of anime pop culture, and continues to influence many shows to this day. Directed by Kunihiko Ikuhara, the story is filled to the brim with abstract storytelling, some of which are delivered through the visuals and deliberate direction, while others are communicated through the nuances of the dialogue. So obviously such an important series would be given a dub with quality comparable to what you'd find in other influential works such as Cowboy Bebop and Fooly Cooly, right? I know you haven't had much time for me lately, but do you really think I'm in your way now? What do you mean? Okay, so the dub for Utena hasn't aged the most gracefully, even though, back in 2001, director Ikuhara did seem to give the dub his seal of approval. He even helped supervise the dub for the Utena movie, presumably to make sure the property wasn't too Americanized, which is funny considering how things could have been. For those who haven't heard, Enoki Films was a Japanese studio with an American branch in LA that acted as sort of a middleman between Japanese companies and American licensors, such as 4Kids and Saban Entertainment. They acquired the North American licensing rights for Utena back in 1997, producing a proof of concept for potential distributors that localized the series for Western audiences, in a way that might have been similar to what those other companies were doing at the time. According to an official website for Enoki Films USA, the character names would have been changed to English equivalents, and the series would have been retitled as Ursula's Kiss. Thankfully, the American distributor, Central Park Media, chose to use the original title, character names were retained, and there's not a lot of evidence of content being edited. These were decisions that I think a lot of anime fans could get behind, and it's clear that those working on this show didn't see it as hacked of material, even if there's still the occasional edition that really doesn't fit. Well, aren't we Miss Self-Sufficient USA? The series was recorded at Sonomat Inc., back when New York had a more prominent dubbing scene, and longtime anime fans might recognize a few actors before they became veterans of the industry. Rachel Lillis as Utena and Crispin Freeman as Toga, for example, stand out as better members of the cast and carry the show's more intense scenes. I came to the school so I could meet him once more. Now the one link I have to the prince forces me to fight him. If only I didn't have this ring. Even if the student council were dissolved, someone who wanted the Rose Bride could not compete for her. Only the one she is engaged to can make the bride do what they want. But the more you explore, the more the dub ends up feeling like a byproduct of the era. The show's sound mixing is far from ideal, with moments where you can actually hear the clicking in actors' mouths as they talk into the mic, while other times some characters might just have their audio louder than others without any noticeable discernible reason. Then there are characters like Anthe and Nanami in particular who both give off performances that feel like the dub couldn't fully embrace their character archetypes. Wakaba's lunch tasted so good? <laughs> I'd like to try making a lunch just like that. The former comes off as too stiff and stilted, while the latter sounds way too dramatic. I mean, I get that Nanami is supposed to be an overly dramatic character that contrasts with everybody else, but there are times where her performance sounds like it belongs in a completely different show. The jig is up! Anthe 
is a great big weirdo. That's what will happen. I call it Operation Anthe's a weirdo who keeps a garter snake in her desk drawer. The script generally gets the gist of the original, even if the wording is pretty blunt, but when the series reaches its more emotionally driven climactic moments, the dub comes off as far too forced and disconnected from the characters' emotional journeys. After everything that's happened over the years, with older shows being dubbed or redubbed sometimes through fan demand alone, Utena feels primed for a redub. Earlier this year, Utena joined Funimation's streaming catalog with other Nozomi classics, so maybe it's also possible that a redub could happen under them. Like I said, there are some decent moments throughout the dub, but as far as whether the old cast could or even should come back to try again is something else. As much fun as I had hearing old New York actors in Utena, I would at least be open to some new voices if they prove themselves legitimately better. Or maybe give it to Sound Cadence Studios given their experience on dubbing older anime with extra polish like Beat X. Some English dubs are enjoyable for so bad it's good reasons, and while I don't think Utena ever truly reached that level of infamy, I do think the lack of polish in some spots resulted in some genuinely enjoyable campiness. Nanami? <gasps> You've got to be careful! I don't want my ball to get scratched up! Ball? That's right, my ball! Your ball? That's right, my ball! That's your ball? My ball! And to be honest, the original version of Utena itself can be campy, with a pretty absurd sense of humor, so part of me wishes that awkwardness could be retained in a redub. Well, initially, it was the line from Utena that Tove says when he sees Utena for the first time and says, Oh yes, oh yes, baby, you've lit the fire in my heart. And I was like, really? Is that really what it says in the Japanese? We like ran it back and played it and it was like, Ine, baby. I was like, okay. <laughs> okay, he's saying baby. All right, roll it. Problem is, though, not all of Utena is like that, and there are some things that don't benefit from that awkwardness. With a careful approach, I do think there's a way a new dub could capture both the flavor of the Japanese and the charm of the first dub. Again, we're not saying that this is what's going to happen, or even that it should. This video is a personal wish list, after all, and you are more than welcome to disagree with us. Some may say it's a good change, others may say it's a bad change. Regardless, if a redub is in the cards for Utena, such a layered and complex show needs to be handled with the time and attention that such an influential classic deserves. It can't be too blunt like what was done before, and the more abstract qualities need to be understood in order to be adapted properly without coming off as an awkward translation. There are plenty of options to explore, as there is no straight, <laughs> forward answer to Ikuhara's insanity. When it comes to Ghost in the Shell, it always seemed weird to me that the most iconic entry in the series has probably the weakest English dub. I mean, come on guys, they've already re-released this film a billion times, so what's one more at this point? Don't get me wrong though, at the time this dub was probably a big deal. Ghost in the Shell 1995 is probably one of the most famous anime films ever. The dub was recorded at animes and directed by an industry legend, the late Kevin Seymour. But I think you can get the gist that this probably isn't some of their finest work. I know we've passive-aggressively alluded to Brian Rue's dismissive comments on this dub in past videos, but the thing is, we don't even really disagree with his view that the Japanese audio for this film is better. It's a story about minds questioning their own existence, in an age where bodies can be manufactured and memories can be faked. There's a lot of introspection and philosophy going on here. By and large, the acting in the English dub sounds, ironically, too robotic. And there are layers of unspoken nuance you miss out on if you've only seen this film dubbed in English. Sometimes I suspect I'm not who I think I am. Like maybe I died a long time ago and somebody took my brain and stuck it in this body. Maybe there never was a real me in the first place and I'm completely synthetic like that thing. Obviously, this ADR team would hone their dubbing over the years through working on other Ghost in the Shell stuff, including the second movie, Innocence, and the TV series, Standalone Complex. The latter in particular is a very well-regarded dub in the community, gaining acclaim on Adult Swim back in the day. The most obvious difference between these dubs and the 95 film are some key characters played by different actors. The Major and Togusa were initially dubbed by Mimi Woods and Christopher Joyce, respectively, 
And again, their relatively dry, office worker-like delivery wasn't a good representation of the very subtle and potent performances of the Seiyu. There's something I've wanted to ask ever since I started. Why did you transfer a guy like me from the police force? If we all reacted the same way, we'd be predictable, and there's always more than one way to view a situation. What's true for the group is also true for the individual. Starting with standalone complex, they were replaced with Mary Elizabeth McLynn and Crispin Freeman, both of whom actually play Connie's parents in Steven Universe. What a waste of the money. You're telling me I should become a cyborg too? Well, it's just a suggestion. I'm not trying to order you around. These two are industry legends, and Standalone Complex is just one moment in their legacy as anime dub actors, doing much more justice to the emotional impact of the source material. You're good with that rifle, you son of a bitch. From now on, you're mine. Not to go too deep into things right here, but I don't think it was just these recasts that quote, fixed the Ghost in the Shell dub. Some of the actors, like Sir William Frederick Knight, did stay on from the first film, but some of them didn't get off to the best start. When it comes to Bato, something that both his seiyu Akio Otsuka and his dub actor Richard Epcar have said in interviews is that he falls in love with the major. And maybe this is just me, but when I first saw this film, it was the dub. And I didn't really get the impression that he loved her, at least not from his vocal performance. Of course, by the end of Standalone Complex, Epcar was able to capture Bato's tender side much better, and now I don't doubt he's got a thing for her at all. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Is that your way of saying you're coming back to Section 9? I wouldn't sweat it if I were you. And it's that level of improvement we'd love to see applied to the first film. It could also be an opportunity to iron out some kinks in the script, like Togusa's incorrectly named gun. Are you ready? With my trusty Mothammer, any time. Or the infamous loose wire line from the start of the movie. What's with all the noise in your brain today? Must be a loose wire. That said, this dub isn't all bad. I especially like Tom Weiner's performance as the puppet master. The advent of computers and the subsequent accumulation of incalculable data has given rise to a new system of memory and thought parallel to your own. Humanity has underestimated the consequences of computerization. We're not saying the old dub should be scrubbed from existence or anything, because again, it was a big deal at the time. Maybe it could be preserved as an extra audio track, the same way the Western DVDs for Akira and Cagliostro preserved their streamlined dubs. Maybe it just wouldn't feel right to redo this dub without Kevin at this point. But imagine if new anime fans got to watch this quintessential film for the first time, and instead of hearing this... There are countless ingredients that make up the human body and mind like all the components that make up me as an individual with my own personality. They got something more like this. When I'm operating under restrictions, I definitely feel constrained by them. But without those restraints, it doesn't seem like my actions are accomplishing anything. What do you think I was searching for as I was wandering around the net? A friend? Truth? Or a certain special someone, maybe? Perhaps I just wanted to blame this organization or even the system for my own sense of helplessness. We are saddened by a bird's cry, but not a fish's blood. Blessed are those with voices. If those dolls had voices, I bet each and every one of them would have screamed, I don't want to be a human. Bateau, the net truly is vast and infinite. You don't look so good. I've had better days. When going through all the possible anime for this video, I found a lot of sports shows worth mentioning. But for now, I want to draw attention to one of my personal favorites. <laughs> Hajime no Ippo is a sports anime that was originally dubbed and licensed as Fighting Spirit by Genion back in 2003. Only the first season and film were dubbed in English and Spanish in the form of multi-part DVDs, some of which I actually still own to this day. Unfortunately, during a 2007 Genion panel, it was revealed that the company most likely wouldn't license the rest of the series at the time because sales of the first season didn't do as well as they had hoped. We really forget there was a time where sports anime were difficult to sell back during the early and mid-2000s compared to today. But after the success of shows like Haikyuu and Kuroko no Basket paving the way for a resurgence in the genre, it is a wonder how this classic would do if re-released today. The original dub also hasn't aged that well, but I still have a personal soft spot for it. 
Most of the cast starts off very awkward and stilted, but a lot of them do warm up to their roles as time goes on, even if most of the performances still don't match the intensity found in the original. Because you're a heavyweight where it counts the most below the belt, right? Believe me, the biggest thing always wins it in the ring. Some of the dated goofiness in the acting felt charming and matched the show's sense of humor. However, that might have also ended up being a double-edged sword. Many younger characters sound okay, and Steve Staley in particular plays a very likable lead, managing to capture Ippo's innocence and growing determination that can be traced from the beginning to the end. I want to be really strong, just like you, Mr. Takamura. I want to be a new person. Mm. <laughs> How does it... How does it feel to be so strong? How does it feel to be strong like you? I can't give up. I won't give up. I've trained too much and come too far to give up now. I will not be defeated! But some of the older and more intimidating characters can come off as more smarmy and cartoony than I think they're supposed to. And during the more intense scenes, it can take viewers out of the drama. And daddy's sad little loser threw the wimpiest punches I've ever felt. <gasps> and you can tell him that from me. That little brat is just lucky hospitalization is all he got. Though the best exception is probably Richard Epcar as Coach Genji, who sounds noticeably disciplined and weathered, though it makes sense that he would have a good grasp of that character since he was also acting as the show's ADR director. Even after all that, I'm still concerned about the kid. I guess I just can't help it. What is it, Chief? In the end, I wasn't able to do anything for him. He would be the one person I would love to see return to the role, and I could easily see a redub work with a lot of the original cast coming back with a modern day direction, since many who worked on the show are now veterans of the industry. Our lord and saviors over at Discotech Media announced that they will be giving the first season its first ever Western Blu-ray release. This would include the first season, the first movie, and even the official Kimura OVA that Genion originally passed up on. The release includes the original English and Japanese dub from Genion, while the OVA would have just the Japanese track. If this sells well, then maybe it could lead to a physical release for the following seasons with their own dub, and a potential redub for that earlier season in the future. Fingers crossed, because this truly is another classic that shouldn't go unappreciated. There are times in a girl's life when she can be a bit unpredictable. <laughs> Next up is Higurashi no Naku Koro ni, specifically the old series that began in 2006, not the recent remake sequel thing that's currently being simuldubbed. While this franchise is well known for its moving and unsettling horror, many fans look upon the dub for the first series as total garbage. But it's not garbage to me! Higurashi was licensed by Genion back in 2007, with Funimation assuming exclusive distribution rights, while the dub itself was handled by Bang Zoom Entertainment. One of the unsettling things about Higurashi is witnessing the differences between how lighthearted and silly the girls are in their everyday lives, compared to how they slowly begin to unravel into insanity throughout each arc. <laughs> In the original, everyone sounds appropriately over the top during these polarizing scenes, but in an unsettling way. Part of the tension in this series is that the daily life is just so wholesome at first, and you just wish things could just be as they seem and none of this dark stuff has to ruin their lives. There's this incredible sinking feeling you get while watching the show, the knowledge that something horrifying is just around the corner. I know it's annoying to talk about it so vaguely, but the real appeal of Higurashi is wrapped up in spoilers. The voice acting is still unsettling in the dub, but not always for the right reasons. Look, it's Sasako! Hey! It's that light-hearted daily life stuff in particular that can fluctuate between too silly at best and incredibly uncanny and stilted at worst. Oh, I forgot. You need to go practice for the cotton drifting. I said many people call the dub total garbage before, maybe even one of the worst ever made, and I agree that it's really not good. But if you want something truly awful, wait for the next entry on this list. Trust me, it is so much worse. Why are you being like this? Like this? Long story short, this dub will get you through the story, but it sure won't be a smooth ride. 
even with some decent parts, it's just hard to stay immersed in this eerie atmosphere of a rural Japanese village in the 80s. The show's second season was never dubbed, and due to low sales, Genion and Funimation allowed the license to expire. Sentai picked up both seasons in 2015, but nothing was dubbed or redubbed, even though that might have been the ideal situation to do so. Although maybe it's pointless to talk about going back to this old version considering we have the new one now, which was ironically licensed by Funimation. Since the old dub was received so poorly, maybe folks don't mind this completely new cast. But it isn't like the first actors involved are terrible actors. Most of them are still pretty active and have done good work in other shows, as has the director Christy Reed, who's handled projects ranging from Durarara Season 1 to the Persona 4 anime, to even western cartoons like We Bear Bears. There is something to be said for bad casting though. The lady who plays Rika in the first dub is older than my parents. We can't do it either, Keiichi. We've got to do some shopping before we go home. Conversely, I do think Megan Hollingshead plays a pretty good Genki character in the form of Mion. Okay then, see you tomorrow! And that ink better stay on your face until you get home, you got that, Keiichi? <sighs> it's still a shame considering how beloved the original series is. When I was getting into anime, I remember Higurashi was such a staple series that was constantly recommended as one of the best horror titles, and it's a shame that the dub never had equal prestige. There is still a lot of anime between the 2006 series and this current one that hasn't been dubbed at all. So whether or not that first installment itself can get a redo, maybe Higurashi can have better luck with English voice acting next time around. But while I think we can all agree that every dub on this list so far isn't up to the standard that the shows themselves deserve, they are still listenable or at the very least possess their own type of charm. Now it's time to take off the kid gloves and talk about a dub that we can all rip apart together. As someone who has yet to fully consume the entire Gundam franchise, Gundam Build Fighters and its sequel Gundam Build Fighters Try were some of the most enjoyable shows I watched in the past decade. Ironic considering that this glorified toy commercial was jam-packed with references and callbacks to Studio Sunrise's catalog that longtime fans were sure to enjoy, all while also embodying the hype you'd see in an exciting sports anime. In the past couple of years, Sunrise has often worked directly with recording studios here in the West when it came to their dubs and localizations. However, despite the success that the Build franchise still seems to generate to this day with its ongoing installations, it's weird that the dub for the first two seasons was treated so differently. According to Nozomi Entertainment, Build Fighters and Try were Animax dubs done by Medilon Limited, a Hong Kong-based recording studio who, at the time of this video, have only really worked on these two shows and Gundam Age. Both seasons were dubbed with the intention of airing in Southeast Asia, and it's not uncommon for shows to receive an English dub specifically for the overseas market. However, Animax dubs haven't exactly been well regarded for their quality compared to the modern standards for English dubbing we've come to expect in other parts of the world. And both of these seasons are no exception. That gem, it's pretty. I have to admit that this is one amazing gunpla. Just pretend I'm not here, alright? In Gundam Build Fighters, everyone's individual sound quality varies differently, which is especially distracting when listening to the show with headphones or a big speaker system. Plus, while it's clear that this show has a primarily young viewer base, I don't think that can excuse some of the really odd and stilted deliveries. <sighs> I'm gonna have to think of another way I can win at Gunpla Battle. Some performances can be listenable, and it's far from the worst Animax dub that I've heard, but it's still very unrefined, and even at its best, everything still comes off as very awkward. Then again, maybe I'm not digging that hard into the dub for Season 1, because Try is just so much worse. Gunpla? What is that? On top of having pretty much all those same issues as Season 1, there are moments as early as Episode 1 where the dub doesn't even match the flaps. And even when they do, there are moments of unnatural pausing or where characters will just speak really quickly as if the actors are running out of breath, sometimes all within the same line. As the winner of the Grand Prix in the Artistic Gunpla Contest, Miss Mirai, I, Yumako Saka, will do all I can to support you! And don't even get me started on Sekai's ability to randomly slip into some unidentifiable accent. My hobby, no actually my life, is the Jigan Hao School of Kenpo. So I'll be your opponent anytime you like. So what should I wear? Not to say that I'm against the use of accents in certain dubs. In fact, when done well, I really think they can add to the show's immersion when working with a cast that are from different regions. Like in season one with Fellini's Italian accent. I mean, to a point. Oh, mamma mia! Right, let's go. Oh. 
Sekai's actor, on the other hand, sounds like they're desperately trying to suppress their natural accent, and what we're left with is this weird middle ground that doesn't sound consistent. And it arguably clashes with the character's place in the story, since it's a way of speaking that he doesn't even share with his sister. Sekai is crude, careless, simple-minded, hot-headed, gluttonous, and disorganized. The following season, Gundam Build Divers, was actually dubbed by Bang Zoom with their regular LA talent, and it actually sounds like a normal dub. Honestly, it'd be great if Sunrise decided to go back and redub the series with at least that same level of quality, because it really is that much fun. With decent performances, I could easily see this series catching on with kids the same way that Beyblade and Bakugan did in the West. The director and writer of Season 1 would actually end up handling My Hero Academia along with the composer who worked on these two seasons. Maybe them all leaving the franchise was what led to the dub being handled differently after the show also ended up going in a different direction. But your guess is as good as mine with regards to the studio's plans moving forward. Hey everyone, thank you all so much for making it to the end of the video, and any updates or corrections can be found in the pinned comment down below. Feel free to let us know if you think any of the anime we mentioned in this video should be redubbed at all, and feel free to comment on any anime that you think deserve a redub of their own. Who knows, if this video does well, maybe we'll do a part 2 down the road. So feel free to like this video and share it around if you'd like to see that happen, and we'll do the best we can. Or if you want to help us out another way, you could always check out our Patreon page. Special thanks to all the patrons who are already supporting us, including Marissa Lenti, JR Pictures, A Hoba, Reagan Senpai, Seth Phillips, Spartacus, Unknown Secret 1000, Queen Era 2, Tristan Galland, Xavier Gordon, and Masosa Gabby. This has been the Cartoon Cipher, and till next time.